Courtney LaBelle found guilty of second-degree murder. A unique climate rally outside Patty Haidu's office. And Atlantic Canada prepares for Hurricane Fiona. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Courtney LaBelle has been found guilty of second-degree murder. The 37-year-old Thunder Bay woman was arrested in January 2020 following the stabbing death of her 11-year-old son. The jury of six men and six women handed down their verdict at 8 o'clock last night after about three and a half hours of deliberations following the two-week trial. They had two choices, either find LaBelle guilty of second-degree murder or guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. In the end, the jury unanimously chose the more serious offense. The assistant Crown attorneys handling the case spoke outside the city courthouse following the verdict. This has been a, a difficult case. It's, it's a very um, tragic situation and a difficult case to put forward. Uh, some difficult evidence in particular, um, some of the photographs and, and video that had to go in to evidence was difficult. Um, really appreciate the um, effort and attention that the, the jury played to the details. Um, we asked them to come back with a finding of guilty of second degree murder and, and that's what they've done. I would like to commend the officers of the Thunder Bay Police Service and uh, the EMS at paramedics and fire that responded on January 1st, 2020. It was evident in meeting with them and hearing their evidence on the stand that the loss of that young boy on January 1st, 2020 deeply impacted them. And I commend them for their efforts to render aid to him on that night. LaBelle broke down in tears following the verdict, which comes with an automatic life sentence. The next step is for the judge to decide how many years LaBelle must serve in jail before becoming eligible for parole. The range is from 10 to 25 years. The jurors each provided their own opinions to the judge on that last night, but their recommendations weren't disclosed. The parties will be back in court on November 28th to set a date for a sentencing hearing. The municipal election is only a month away as of tomorrow. City of Thunder Bay officials are encouraging residents to update their voter information. Pop-up booths are being set up at several locations over the next week. Voter information can also be updated on election day, but doing so in advance can help speed things up at the polls. More than 82,000 voter information letters have been sent in the mail, but for anyone whose details are incorrect or who didn't get a letter, elections workers are available in person or by phone to update voter registration. Every Canadian citizen aged 18 and up and living within a municipal boundary is eligible to vote in the election. We do recognize that since the last municipal election, there might be some changes on those voter information letters. Your name may have changed. Uh, you may live at a new address. So what we have over the next week or so are pop-up locations, an opportunity for you to come down and revise that information to ensure that when you cast your ballot uh, in October, we have the correct information for you. For those who can't make it to a pop-up booth in person, voter information can also be updated at City Hall or by calling the voter information line at 622-VOTE. The pop-up booth will be at Intercity Mall for the next five days with additional dates at the Thunder Bay Country Market and next weekend at Goods & Co. in the former Eaton's building. A unique climate rally was held outside of Liberal MP Patty Haidu's office today. The climate disco was meant to celebrate what the world has already begun to do to help mitigate the, the climate crisis. Of course, those who came out today say they want to go even further and they want the government to hear their call. Riley McManus was there. <laughs> This event was one of 35 Canadian global climate strikes taking place across Canada. Event organizer Paul Berger wanted to bring a fun feel and went with a disco theme. There was music playing and pizza for all participants. Unlike previous climate rallies, this one focused on celebrating all the progress the world has made in moving towards the world with net zero emissions. Berger explained some of the accomplishments thus far. The Ford F-150 Lightnings are in town now. If you could watch the drivers as they pass the gas stations with a big smile on their face because it takes $20 to put 500 kilometers of charge on them. 
this is the world we're going to have, but we just we want our politicians to move faster. Berger admits he feels the world is starting to listen, as top political leaders such as the UN Secretary General are starting to take action by calling for windfall tax on oil companies who are making record profits. Some LU international students were among those who participated in the climate disco. I think it's important for me as an international student here in Thunder Bay to make our voices and our presence noted because we are part of this community and I come from Mexico. It's a, it's a country that has already been impacted by climate change. Fellow LU students Aklima Jupika and Pia Durba are from Bangladesh. Both expressed how their country has been severely affected by climate change, such as a major flooding this past June. Uh, it was a terrible flood as I was not there. Uh, but uh, I can feel that and I saw lots of videos and I heard from my uh, family. Uh, it was too much this time. MP Patty Haidu was not at her office. But that did not stop the crowd from dancing around and holding their signs for all who were driving by to see. Many took the microphone and spoke about the positive changes they have witnessed in regards to the climate crisis and also some words of encouragement for the government to keep moving towards a cleaner planet. Riley McManus, TBT News. The federal government is making a $1.3 million investment into Confederation College. The money is meant to increase the school's capacity for renewable energy and achieve net zero. It's also to enhance the curriculum as well. Jessica Clement has the details. On Friday morning, Rainy River MP Marcus Palowski stopped by the college's McIntyre building to announce that Natural Resources Canada has invested $1.3 million to support the college's work on renewable energy. College President Kathleen Lynch says the funds will go into developing a plan for the college to continue its energy reduction activities. She says that so far they have reduced their energy consumption by 40 percent and are hoping to have it at 60 percent by 2030. It's extremely important to our region to show that these energy projects are doable and also they make really good economic sense. Uh, we are saving a quarter of a million dollars alone in heating our main campus building, the Shunya building, by using these different technologies to reduce our energy consumption and we know that's only going to grow over time. The money will also go into a new lab at the school, as well as developing a curriculum for students to learn how to work with green forms of technology. But it also trains students to have these, the technical knowledge to be able to work in the field. Um, and, and certainly there's a couple reasons to think that's a good idea. One, because it gives people good jobs. But two, that it actually makes us able to use these forms of technology. The investment will also help the college set up a study to look at how communities, including First Nations, can better use renewable sources of energy to help bring Canada to a net zero future. Jessica Clement, TBT News. Local gas prices are on the rise again at some local stations. A few gas bars have hiked their rates by a whopping 22 cents. The two Shell stations on the corner of Red River Road and Junot have jacked up their prices to $1.81.9 a litre. Two Esso stations on Memorial Avenue and Arthur Street have also gone up $0.22. Cents. Most other stations in town are still sitting at $159.9, but this Esso station on Red River that you're seeing on the screen now did also go up to $1.81 as well over the last couple hours after our camera left. It's unclear if the other local stations will follow suit. According to OntarioGasPrices.com, the average cost in the province is $147.5. Tens of thousands of Ontario education workers, including librarians, custodians and administrative staff, began voting today on whether to strike. The Canadian Union of Public Employees has called Ontario's initial contract offer insulting and is recommending the workers vote yes. Janice Golding has the story. A strike vote has begun for Ontario's 55,000 education workers, librarians, custodians, office staff, educational assistants and early childhood educators being encouraged by their union to give the bargaining team a strike mandate. With education workers having already involuntarily taken an 11% wage cut from 2012 to 2021, 
and high inflation at 7%, now eroding the value of our pay even more. The Ford government offered the lowest paid education workers an insulting 33 to 53 cents per hour, the equivalent of less than a tank of gas per month. The union is asking for a $3.25 hourly pay hike, which amounts to about 11.7%. The province, meanwhile, has offered a 2% hike per year for four years for those making less than $40,000 and a 1.25% increase for those who make more than that. Education workers want to be in school doing the work that we love, but we can't do our work well when we're doing the jobs of two or three people because of cuts and understaffing. In a memo earlier this week, members were informed no progress had been made during bargaining on Tuesday and Wednesday, just before the strike vote began. Voting continues through to October the 2nd. We will keep fighting for better pay for workers after a decade of wage cuts. And while inflation is skyrocketing for the protection of minimum staffing levels to ensure students' needs are met and for an investment in additional staffing to improve the quality of education. The education minister, meanwhile, has criticized QP for planning strike votes before the first offer was tabled. That was CTV's Janice Golding reporting. Well, the province this morning released its public accounts for last year, showing how government funds were spent and reporting a $2.1 billion surplus. Building upon record spending in 2020-21, our government invested $170.5 billion in 2021-22. This includes $9.6 billion more in base funding for health care, education, infrastructure, and other key initiatives for Ontario's future. Health was by far the ministry that spent the most at more than $66 billion, followed by education and children, community, and social services. Ministers say the surplus is not an indication of the fiscal outlook for this year. The NDP argues the public accounts show the Ford government is underfunding public services, just as health and cost of living crises come to a head. Another large piece of the former Resolute Mill in Fort Francis came crashing down early this morning. The boiler at the old plant was toppled by crews with Canadian National Demolition around 5 a.m., apparently catching a lot of residents by surprise. The boiler itself has been the source of controversy as the province provided the company with $23 million to build it back in 2009. The Liberal government then forgave the loan after Resolute closed the mill in 2014, and now the investment has become scrap. The demolition began in early 2021. Another large implosion brought down the craft mill last fall. The entire site cleanup was expected to take 18 to 22 months and is now getting closer to being finished. A local church-based charity group is celebrating a major achievement Volunteers with Memo recently filled their 100th ocean container with medical equipment and supplies to be shipped to third world hospitals that need it most. Jonathan Wilson has that story. The Memo volunteers were back at the LPH grounds this past weekend, loading another sea can with wheelchairs and other medical equipment. And this sea can has a special distinction as the 100th container filled by Memo over the past 18 years. I'm very happy about it. When we started out in uh, 2004, if you told us that we were eventually going to be shipping 100 containers, I would have said you were, you were crazy. But we've just shipped one container at a time. It means that we've shipped a lot of uh, medical equipment and humanitarian supplies that otherwise would have ended up in uh, landfill in here in Thunder Bay. Dr. Jerome Harvey came up with the idea for Memo in the winter of 2004 when the former McKellar and Port Arthur General Hospitals closed, leaving roomfuls of outdated medical equipment that could still be useful in other parts of the world. Uh, the new hospital had, of course, all new equipment, so there was uh, two, it actually came to about 750 bed of uh, hospital equipment that uh, was available. So that in that first year, we actually shipped 19 ocean containers, 11 to Cuba and 8 to the Philippines. Since then, Memo has also shipped containers to Nicaragua, Liberia and Sierra Leone. The group's main focus recently has been on Zimbabwe, where this latest container is headed. Much of the contents come from local clinics and drugstores, along with hospitals from all around the Northwest. We just got a pallet of uh, medical supplies from Lake of the Woods Hospital, Adikokan, uh, Geraldton, Nipigon, 
Manitowoc, basically all the district hospitals uh, supply us with medical equipment that is, most of it is still good, but uh, not necessarily state of the art, but it's better than having nothing like they do in Zimbabwe. Harvey says when Memo first started out, they had about 100 volunteers. That number now sits at about 20, and he says they could really use more. The average age of our volunteers is about 75, and uh, so they get, you know, they, they pass on, and uh, so we constantly need a new supply of volunteers. Most of our volunteers say they, they really enjoy it. It becomes a whole family, social life. So I was, to your viewers, I'd say if uh, you're, you're feeling lonesome or useless or bored, uh, then uh, we'd be happy to have you come and volunteer with us. It will cost about $33,000 to ship this container to Zimbabwe, so Harvey is encouraging people to attend their fundraising dinner this Sunday evening at the Victoria Inn to help keep the memo effort going for the next 100 containers. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. For the final time in his tenure as mayor, Bill Morrow teed off for the 18th annual Mayor's Mulligan Golf Tournament at Strathcona Golf Course today in support of Pro Kids. Oh, I pulled it way oh, that was a big <laughs> Around 90 golfers took a swing this morning at the event presented by Enbridge, a week later than planned due to last Friday's rainstorm. All the funds raised go to help low-income families access recreation activities for their kids. Programs supported by Pro Kids include local youth hockey, swimming and soccer, along with arts and cultural programs. Even though it's his last tournament as mayor, Morrow knows it's as important as ever. It's hard to really quantify exactly what you can gain by being part of teams uh, when you're young. I don't think you realize it at the time, but you certainly do as you age. And so this may give some of those opportunities to some of the young kids in our community. It's critical for youth and children to have access to recreational activities and supporting pro kids is a way for Enbridge to do this. We're probably up in the $20,000 range as a, as a charitable uh, event this year as the proceeds that we will receive. The total amount raised for pro kids this year should be known by Monday. Daniele says they're thankful for the mayor's years of support for one of the not-for-profit's biggest fundraisers of the year. Well, Fiona, with those temperatures dropping, you've got to wonder how many good golf days there are left on the calendar. Yes, especially when you see overnight lows uh, cracking the freezing mark. Yes, we sunk into negative numbers last night uh, or in the early morning hours, a low of minus one. And that's despite southwest winds three to about 20 kilometers per hour throughout the day. We did, though, have lots of sunshine. And uh, that, combined with a southerly flow, brought temperatures into seasonal, uh, actually above seasonal range. Currently, uh, or we saw a high of 18. Currently at this time, we are at 15 Celsius. But we're not the only ones that uh, slipped in below the freezing mark last night. That was the trend to the west in Atacocan and Fort Francis. They're at 15 at this hour under mostly cloudy skies. Similar temperatures at this time in Kenora and Dryden. Red Lake 13 under cloudy conditions. As we head eastward, it's actually a little bit warmer. We've got some heat, believe it or not, uh, in the more northern, se northern sections of uh, the region. Big Trout Lake currently at 18, 17 in Armstrong, 16 in Greenstone with loads of sunshine. That sunshine continues through Marathon and down into Sault Ste. Marie, where they are currently at 16 Celsius. Now tonight, we are going to drop back down into the single digits, but just barely, 9 Celsius under mostly cloudy skies. And uh, you definitely want to get used to seeing the clouds once again because they're going to be lingering for the weekend. I'll have more details later on in the news hour. Okay, thanks a lot, Fiona. Well, there are no thanks being given from folks in Atlantic Canada to Hurricane Fiona. That's because the powerful storm is set to make landfall overnight. We'll have all the details as your Friday news hour continues. <laughs>